idea of daily news and Memphis news and the Twitter's way of the state and place to show and everything that they were disturbing them with people in this room of Ben on. Um, that was awesome. Can I just go out here for a second? That was fantastic. I've never been out. I've never known why we cover so many little esoteric kind of buildings that are being redeveloped and little projects in the pocket park. And you know, I'm a publisher, so they have to do it. And I say, we're going to cover that. So they cover that, or why we do shows like that. But he articulated why that's so important. And that was a pretty, pretty amazing thing. Um, when I'm going to introduce, we're going to switch now to, uh, I'm introducing um, uh, Michael Randall from uh, Southern Business and Development and some other uh, websites and um, news entities that, that he can talk about. I met him just before this at lunch, and I think even before I, I had said much of anything, someone else at the table said, what do you do? And he said, oh, we take Yankee businesses to the south. <laughs> and, uh, at the bottom, and I thought, well, he hadn't heard my voice yet, because I may have been in Memphis for 22 years, but by a lot of definitions, I'm still a Yankee. So um, uh, I first got my first job up in Connecticut um, 25 years ago as a reporter, and um, Connecticut was in a recession then. I was just out of college. Um, I didn't know what a recession was really. I just knew that um, my total salary was a lot less than my total student debt. That was the sum total of my um, economic understanding. But Connecticut was in a recession. It was a recession for two reasons. One was that the defense was post-Cold War. The defense industry was winding down. And that whole region um, of New England was just killed by this. The rest of the country was doing OK at that time. But New England was getting killed by this, that recession. It was also getting hurt because, and this is fitting, and I wrote this part before I met Michael, um, manufacturing was leaving Connecticut. And I remember one story, an early story I covered, was a, the last of the apparel manufacturers, there were about 100 people, was closing. And it was in this little town of Chester, Connecticut. And all the, they were moving it to North Carolina. And like all, you know, this little town and all of that Connecticut River Valley had been based on apparel and um, all kinds of sewing and so on for 100 years. It had been a bedrock of the, the economy. In that part of Connecticut, that was the last manufacturer to close and move to the south. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to the mayor, and you know, he's asking a question of when this plant closed, and it was he was very patient and listened to my question, as mayors often do even still, and knew I had no idea what I was talking about. But I said, you know, what? How is the city going to survive the loss of taxes? And he said, Well, Eric, it's not the loss of taxes; it's the loss of jobs. I, I, because there's no other jobs at that time Connecticut to, to move to. And so I think it's interesting, and I think about that a lot, and about the move of, at that time, 25 years ago, of jobs to the South. Um, it's been such a topic nationally in all the last elections, but certainly this last one, um, the loss of jobs to Mexico or to Canada. Um, but a lot of those jobs came to the South. And there is a whole dynamic, if you think about the country. The country is a region. The country is a collection of disparate entities. Some parts gain, some parts lose. Hopefully, overall, the country as a whole, and as, a, as I read on Michael's side today, manufacturing is doing really well in certain ways in this whole country. It's just there's been shifts from one area to the other. Um, so I, I look forward to, to hearing from Michael Randall. Um, it, the bio is obviously in the, um, the agenda. You can hear some of the other sites. And welcome. Thank you. Can anybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, great to be in Memphis. Love this town. Um, know a lot of folks in Memphis. Got a lot of ideas in Memphis um, for what I do. Um, am I loaded here, Eric? Yeah. Those are our products. I think you'll like Randall's work. Southern Business Devel Development Magazine has been around since 1992, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, later on this year. Um, Randall Ford, I think you'll really like, is an aggregator of Southern news. You can go on Randall Report and get every single significant news item that happened that day in the South. We have three live editors. It's it's uh, hair on fire kind of work. They go to over 250 Southern. Um, news outlets, new, uh, media properties, and they post a story every five minutes. It's crazy. Um, but the cool thing about it is, is we use Randall Report to write off all our other media properties. So it's a really good um, uh, product. Before I start, I do want to write, how many economic developers we have in here? Well, so we got a few, good. Um, how many mayors we got in here? 
Good, we got a few. All right. Well, I wrote this book called You Might Be a Southern Economic Developer If. You inform your family that you're taking a new job in an adjoining state, and they ask if they can ride in the house during the move like the last time. <laughs> and this is for the mayor. Your four-year-old daughter tells her kindergarten classmates that you make her living by driving around in the woods with the mayor and one other man. <laughs> All right, I don't have much time. Let me set my clock. Um, we're about 25 minutes over, so I'll make this quick. All right, well, I'm not a economist. I speak with a lot of economists, mainly um, uh, Mark Vittner and uh, the Wells Fargo senior economist. I, I speak with Dennis Lockhart, the, the recently retired Atlanta Fed chairman. I'm an economic development journalist. We look at the economy in different ways. The basis of how we look at an economy are two things. Project activity in the South. Remember, I don't, I don't cover the nation. I only cover the South. Uh, it's not a Southern deal, it's a bad deal. We are the nation's, we are the world's fourth largest economy based on GDP. United States is number one, China is number two, some folks that have bad data have Germany and Japan, uh, three and four, it's not true. The latest uh, uh, data shows that India is number three, and the American South has an economy larger than Germany and Japan. Can you believe that? It's an unreal statistic. So what we do, we base our view of the economy based on project activity. Now look at 1992 up there. For decades, as y'all know, until the 50s, and mechanization on the farm started, we were a, um, Chris was just talking about it, we were bringing in textiles, apparel, I mean, you name it, from the Northeast and elsewhere. Um, from the 50s to the 80s and even early 90s. If you look at 1992, what you, what you see up there is a chart of projects of 200 jobs or more or 30 million or more in investment. It doesn't have to be both, it could be one or the other. And they're separated by manufacturing and service. In 1992, you had 274 uh, manufacturing projects, 162 service projects, and you can look at subsequent states, but in 1996 something happened. There were 212, based on our data, manufacturing deals and 361 service deals. You've got a lot in the media talking about China, 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 taking our manufacturing um, in the South. Look at the subsequent years. Look at the service side, 407 and 97, 344, 346, 245, 297. Look at the manufacturing side. Look at 2001 and 2002. This was the peak of offshoring because we could not compete. We could not compete with labor costs. We could not compete with energy costs and manufacturing was essentially going away. Um, it, was, it wasn't just going to China, it was going to Mexico, it was going to Thailand, it was going to Vietnam, you name it, but basically, we had turned into a service economy. Laws were written during Clinton's administration where basically, to create jobs, we were money, moving money around, okay? Um, you know, Home equities started then. Oh, good. Let's borrow money on our first home so we can go buy a second home. Not smart. But it was the only way to create jobs because we were losing our manufacturing base. But look at 2004. There were 202 manufacturing deals and 297 uh, services deals. So we were catching up. And nobody was figuring out why. These are 
later years, for the first time in 11 years, starting 2006, manufacturing beat services in deals of 200 jobs or more, or 30 million or more. That was 2006. We were freaking out at the office because who remember the statement, manufacturing is gone and it's never coming back? Okay, manufacturing is a dinosaur. There was a whole class of economic developers that were taught in the South that were actually told don't recruit manufacturing because it doesn't exist anymore. Look at 2010, 335 to 259. Look at the other years. Look at 2000, well, look at 2009 first. Total crater on both ends, 228 to 140. 140 projects of 200 jobs or more on the services side. You know what that was? It was the Great Recession and financial services, one of our biggest service side uh, job generator, just collapsed, especially in 2008 with 138. Look at 2013, 2014, look at 2015. We'll have 2016 numbers um, next week. Look at total deals though, 730 deals. You gotta go all the way back to 1997, look at the last two years, 668 and 730. You gotta go back to, the, to 1978 eight, and, and 1997 when services were just going crazy. That was the dot-com uh, situation. But manufacturing has not only come back, we are as competitive as we've ever been when it comes to manufacturing. So some of the things that you're hearing and I'm not, I'm not going to get political on this, but some of the things that you are hearing, that manufacturing is gone, we've got to bring on our manufacturing, that has been going on. We've been bringing back manufacturing since 2010, if you look at the numbers. Okay? In fact, if you look at 2015, this is as good as it gets when it comes to economic development. That's a record year in 20, almost 25 years. So when you hear the economy, okay, is not doing so hot, when it comes to economic development, it's as good as it gets. All right? All right, let me go over some other things. Y'all got enough time on that chart? All right. Here are the South's leading um, industries. Automotive has gone crazy and has been for years and years. There's no industry even close to competing with automotive in the South. Um, the fact that our energy costs are so low, and that's all based on the fracking frenzy, there are companies from all over the world going to Louisiana, Texas, to build petrochemical plants. That There's one town in Louisiana, Lake Charles, Okay, that has 85 billion, that's with a B, project slated. 85 billion. Most states don't do 6 billion in a year in terms of capital investment. Lake Charles has 85 billion, and it's only because of cheap industry. Our natural gas here in the state is less than anywhere in the world. In fact, we're now starting to export it. It's a third the cost of Europe. It's a fourth the cost of Japan. Do you know how much it costs to run a petrochemical chemical plant um, in terms of energy costs in Louisiana or Texas? Uh, on average, about 1.5 million a month in an energy bill. So if, you're gonna, if you wanna pay 1.5 billion in Louisiana, or four or five or six billion in Europe, what are you gonna do? So chemicals have gone nuts. Look at financial services. This tells you how much money is on the street right now. I'm checking my time, I'm not checking my, I had a speech with my wife here recently. I kept checking the time on my phone. She thought I was checking text. <laughs> anyway, so look at financial services. 
in 2011, it wasn't the, the <coughs> manufacturing sector that cratered in the, the Great Recession. It was the services sector. I showed you those numbers. Services sector in 2011, nine deals of 200 jobs. That rose to 19 in 2012, 31 in 2013. Look at <coughs> 2016, or 2015. 69 financial service of jobs, 200 jobs more. What does that mean? There's a lot more money on the street, okay, right now. Again, this is as good as it, as it gets. Um, but there are some things changing now that are very dicey to this economy. And it's not something that you're hearing from. Oh, we've heard nobody's investing in this country? Look at 2015. Those are the top 100 projects that, that announced in the South in 2015. Look at 2014. Look, when you have the cheapest energy costs in the world, you're going to have investments off the charts. So whatever you hear on the street that nobody's investing in the South, they're completely wrong. Okay, let's look at some of the things you've been hearing. Offshoring. Yes, when you saw all those manufacturing project activity just drop through the floor, okay, from, two th from the mid-90s, okay, to really 2010, we lost about 2 million jobs to China, manufacturing jobs. Of those, we were really hurt because furniture, apparels, and really everything else. It wasn't just us that was hurt. It was Canada, it was Mexico. Um, they went to China and they were chasing one thing. Back then, 58 cents an hour. That was the prevailing wage. You, you bought something that, that was built at Foxconn, you're paying 58 cents an hour. Okay? All right. That's what we lost in offshoring. This is what we gained in reshoring. How many people have heard about reshoring? Okay. Reshoring is a thing based on our competitive, on, on being competitive. If China is not so competitive, why? I, I mean, those companies did not go to China because their central location. They didn't go to China because less corrupt government. They didn't go to China because of great craftsmanship. They went to China for one reason, 58 cents an hour. The prevailing wage now in China is about 680. So it's not so attractive. Once you count the shipping cost and that kind of thing, it's, what, what this has become is make it where you sell it. You can call it reshoring, you can call it onshoring, nearshoring, whatever, but it's gotten to the point in this world where you want to make it where you sell it. But there's some really interesting things happening, more about reshoring. When reshoring started, and that was about 2010, um, the Boston Consulting Group uh, basically invented it. They figured this out. Uh, we were the first publication that actually used the, re the word reshoring, and we didn't know how to spell it. Okay, is it re-shoring? And so the common use right now is reshoring as one word, just like offshoring is one word, okay? But Boston Consulting Group said that three million jobs, they said this in 2011, will be created, okay, by 2020. That's not gonna happen. What's happening is we've, recru we've created about 800,000, okay? and we'll never get to three million. Why? Automation is caught up to us. Not only that, we're running out of labor. Um, we're at full employment right now. We're at 4.5%. You can see some of the accolades, longest consecutive monthly jobs uh, gains in US history, third longest recovery period. Whoever is telling you, okay, that this is not a good economy, is lying their ass off. <laughs> I'm serious. 
I mean, look at those accolades right there. I mean, we have gotten so political, so divisive, that if someone creates a good economy, it can't be true. And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying, look at the data. Data doesn't lie. Okay? That's data right there. And we have some... We have some... Uh, data, some other data that's going to kind of explode the myths of what you're hearing as well, and here's some of it. We're running out of labor. We've averaged 200,000, 180,000 a month in new jobs for almost three years now. Okay? President Trump got a great boost. Of course, his January numbers were attributed to him, but his February numbers, 235,000, what it was, you know, that's fine. Give credit to him. Okay? But we've been running about a hundred and, what does it say, about $185,000 or, or, or jobs a month, the average jobs created per month, 2011-2016. Look at the projected average number of jobs created for many years to come. <clears throat> it's going to drop to 3,000 3, to 75,000. Okay? Here's the telling statistic. For decades, economists always said if you create 150,000 jobs okay, a month, it's a good month. Anything over 150,000 jobs a month, you're going to lower the unemployment rate. Anything under 150,000 jobs, the employment rate's going to go up. Well, that was based on 200,000 people entering the workforce, which is age 16. We, I mean, you go back to the 50s, you could count on, on average, 200,000 people a month entering the work workforce. Do you know how many people entered the workforce the last two years, for turn 16, 71,000 a month. We've dropped from 200,000 people entering the workforce per month to 71,000. Okay? That's scary. So, if you needed a, if, when 200,000 people a month, all right, were entering the workforce, you had to create about 150,000 jobs a month to make it stable, because those there's going to be 50,000 or more going to school or whatever. They could be in high school. I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of 16-year-olds out there driving their Cam Camaro to junior high because they failed three years. You know, so uh, the numbers, we are aging. We are aging, and we are aging fast. Millennials are not having kids. Why? Can't afford them. Okay? This nation is aging so <coughs> fast. So, alright, I'm not on Trump, okay, here, but he's gonna, he's gonna create 25 million jobs in 10 years, which, by the way, if he wins the second term, that's two years after his second term. Y'all, there aren't 7 million people in this country that can have a job. Okay, that are available. I'll tell you why. You hear this from the media. But 95 million Americans are outside the workforce, inferring there are 95 million Americans without a job who want one. How many people have heard the workforce participation rate is the lowest in American history. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that workforce participation rate. Of those 95 million, 12.9 million are caretakers. Disabled, 15.4 million. Did y'all even know that those are counted? College students, 20.5 million. Retirees, 44 million. That is the scary part. Okay? In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the college students and the retirees were reversed. It'd be 
20 million retirees, 44 million college students. So we're aging. It's not such a bad thing. Japan has no workforce left, but they have 3% unemployment. It's just those days of 200,000 200, people a month, okay, getting a job, are, is gonna be reduced in coming years and for many years to come. We're not talking about who's president or whatever. For many years to come, you're gonna see an average. There are gonna be a few more months over the next year or two, well, you'll see 200,000 jobs or, uh, or, or more created. But be prepared, okay, to see 30,000, 50,000, 75,000. What happened last month? We had 225, we had 235. Anybody remember the last month's figure? 98,000. It's gonna keep dropping. There'll be those outliers where you'll see 200, but get used to about, over the next year and a half, get used to about 70,000 jobs. The demographics just show that that is the only thing that's gonna take 70,000 new jobs to keep this economy growing. All right? Um, by the way, of the family taker, family caretakers, remember, I heard tre tre uh, President Trump say, there's 95 million people outside of the workforce. Again, family taker, caretakers, 13 million. Disabled, 15 million. College students, 20 million. Retirees, 44 million. That means 92.9 million of the 95 million people he is talking about have a reason not to work. Doesn't leave much, okay? And we're gonna cut in immigration, and we're gonna get uh, the undocumented out of here. Y'all, forget skilled workers. We start getting rid of the undocumented, we won't have unskilled workers. There won't be people picking stuff on farms, in hotels, construction jobs, Right now, we're in a situation where companies can't find one friggin' worker. Not the hundred that they need. And those, those workers that I was telling you about, all those petrochemical plants in Louisiana, Texas, it's gotten to the point where you wait, a company, you know, announces a $10 billion petrochemical bill or, or announcement, they gotta wait on the one that's being built to have the welders, once they finish, go over there. <coughs> We're tight. Things are getting better though. Oh, by the way, worker participation, when, remember when I said uh, worker participation is the worst in history? In 1970, it's 60.4%. 99, 60.1%, that's the highest ever. 2017, 63.8%. So we're really in a situation where we're just average. Okay, this is not the worst worker participation rate ever. It's about in the middle. Okay, and y'all know what the what the definition of worker participation is. Anybody 16 to 65 years old, okay, and if they're not participating, they're not finding a job, Okay, and they're not employed. And if you want to go to U9 and U6 or U3, we'll talk about that later. Okay, this is how we're going to get our labor. We're almost out of labor now. Uh, we're full employment. But who's heard about the automation bomb? The automation bomb, and some people say, We'll lose 5 million jobs by 2020. But look at that last one. 40% of all jobs being filled today, or work today, will be lost to automation by 2040. So this tight labor market may just take care of itself in the next five, six, seven years. If automation, but I don't think anybody's really got their hands around 
how many jobs are going to be lost to automation. But I will say this. The economy is changing. It's changing so fast. We're at full employment. Okay? Finding anybody to create you know, millions of jobs a year is impossible unless we triple immigration. We're bringing in about a million a year right now, not counting the legals. The legals are about 500,000 a year, which has dropped dramatically. At its height, it was 5 million a year. Okay, so we're at a point where if we're going to build a wall, we need to build a wall to keep them in. <laughs> because we've run out of labor so fast. Okay, I mean, y'all, this is as good as it gets. We're at 4.5% unemployment. I showed you, okay, that 95 million people who are not participating, they don't exist. Okay, so I, I support extreme vetting. Okay, I'm not sure if we're doing extreme vetting right now. Okay, but we really need to bring in more work. Uh, I think that's all I got. Uh, I'll open up to questions if any, anybody has any. <laughs> any questions? I mean, that's just data, remember. <laughs> data does not lie. Yes? What? Area. What? Area? Oh, well, the South creates, uh, I mean, you're looking at it. Um, you know, there's one statistic that really blows everybody's mind that I say all the time is when I was born, okay, and that wasn't that long ago, 50 uh, something years, but closer to 60. <laughs> um, there were the South, the Midwest, and the Northeast had all about the same population. Okay? It was in between 54 and 56 million people. Today, the Midwest has 61 million people. So you can see from 54 to 61, not so much. Northeast has 63 million. So from 56 to 63 million, not so much. At the time, the South had 55 million people. Today, it's 128 million people. We have more people living in the South than the Northeast and the Midwest combined. We had the same population 58 years ago. Okay, so economic development doesn't happen without people. If you're losing population, why do you have to create jobs? If you're gaining population, in the case of Florida, 1,000 people a day. In the case of Texas, 1,500 people were there. Okay? Um, you have to create jobs all the time. So, you know, the South is, is basically 40% of everything. We're 40% of GDP, 40% of population, 40% of NFL players. I mean, we're 40% we're of everything. 40% of NBA players. I mean, you name it. And so, you know, we are the economic engine of this country. So, if that being the case, and all these people migrating here, this this region, on average, creates 52% of all jobs in this country. And there's four regions. Okay, so the South's there. Well, I think that's true because, you know, more manufacturing jobs are in the South than any other region. Um, you know, but the case of income inequity is, um, unfortunately, a huge situation right now. 
you know, Bernie Sanders wants to do $15 an hour nationwide. That is silly. Go to MIT Living Wage Calculator. Has there anybody ever heard of that? Go to the MIT Living Wage Calculator. Um, obviously, it's by MIT. And what they've done is they've broken down what a living wage is in every county in America. And if you went $15 an hour in, say, Dyersburg, okay, they couldn't compete. Those companies would close. But if you look at the MIT wage calculator, you know, you could look at Dyer County and go, well, a living wage there is $9.20. You know, $14 an hour in New York buys you something like $10 something. I'm from Birmingham. $9 an hour buys you, uh, is worth $7.06. And so it, it, this thing of just saying $15 every, everywhere is silly. It needs to be based on cost of living everywhere. Anything else? Okay, thank y'all very much.